I believe that most of us have experienced loneliness at some point in our lives. Loneliness to me can differ in severity. Sometimes we can feel lonely when we're away from home, from familiarity or people we love. This is a natural feeling, although uncomfortable. This reminds us that we miss something. Usually we're able to find our own inner resources or reach out to alleviate this feeling. However, prolonged loneliness without support can have a damaging impact on our mental health and well-being. The study is looking into the overall relationship between loneliness and technology use, mainly mobile phones. If we are feeling lonely internally for a long time and we don't feel able to talk about this or seek support, then this isolation can lead to depression and anxiety. It can also create feelings of shame within us, and shame manifests in silence. The situation can sometimes feel helpless, and this silence keeps us lonely and isolated. To look into the causes of loneliness, how people can get help, and how technology impacts the lives of those that are lonely, I spoke to two charities located here in the UK. Time to talk befriending and wavelength. I suppose for a long time loneliness has, has been like a hidden problem, a hidden disease really. Um, I guess recently it's become a lot more uh, in the public front and got a bit more profile. The world in 2020, I think, contributes to um, loneliness in terms of there's more breakdown of relationships at every level, which causes stress and also causes people to perhaps pull back and say, well, I can't be bothered with that. I'm just going to live on my own or do my own thing. Yeah, I think all those are much more recent things which cause loneliness. I think materially, People have generally resources and money, but um, it's more really human thing of, of caring and um, reaching out and spending time. Um, so 92% of people um, struggle to tell someone else that they're lonely, and 9 million people feel lonely or often lonely uh, throughout the UK. And on any given day, about half of those who are disabled also feel lonely. So it is a, an issue which affects all of us at different parts of our life. Hi, I'm Cherish Watton and I'm Communications Officer for Wavelength Charity. So we're a national charity that gives out radios, televisions and tablet computers to people who are lonely and most in need. I think how people uh, become lonely, is a there's a whole host of reasons why people become lonely. Um, and that's one of the things, it's such a multi-layered um, subjective feeling that it happens, sometimes it can come out of nowhere um, and sometimes it can last for months or even years. And I think then that's when it becomes particularly problematic because the longer you're lonely, the harder it is to then do something about it because you sort of lose self-confidence, self-esteem and you become more vulnerable. Um, so it really depends on the kind of situation you're in, who you know, where your friends and family are, if they're in the UK, across the world, um, and how much support you have around you, and as well as your financial income as well, because research shows that loneliness does hit people harder uh, the less money they have, because it's more difficult to then take those first steps. So we find that technology use helps to reduce people's loneliness and makes them feel happier. Uh, we find it's a really good way for people to maintain and increase the number of meaningful connections they have in their lives. Um, and we would never advocate that technology should sort of replace human contact. That's not what we say at all. We need meaningful human face-to-face -face connection. But for some people who can't get out of their homes or struggle to socialise, then technology has a really important part to play. It is a tool that can be used to really bring people together in meaningful ways. A couple of simple points on combating loneliness. I mean, one of the simple things is really, I just always have a picture of a teapot. You know, a teapot is just a symbol of sitting down with somebody and having a cup of tea. And it seems such a simple thing, but it's actually very powerful. The other side is like a bouncing ball. That is, you, you bounce the ball, it comes back up. There's your giving as a volunteer or a visitor or a family member, as you're giving time to other people, you know, you get a lot back. It bounces back to you in terms of what you get out of it as well. So it's not just a one-way thing of combating loneliness. You're also, in some way, helping your own well-being, really, by helping others. It does bounce back 
um, to help you. The first thing uh, that people can do is to recognise that they're feeling lonely and that sounds a really easy thing to do but it's actually one of the hardest steps um, because it's, there's such a big stigma associated with being lonely um, even though it's something that sort of two out of three of us will experience um, at some point in our lives. Um, and obviously with what we do when we give out technology, we see technology as being a really vital way to bring people together. So whether it's um, emailing, using Facebook, Twitter, Skype, um, to connect with family and friends, joining online forums, um, or even coming together to listen to a radio show or a television program, we find is uh, really transformative in helping people who are lonely. Both the charities do fantastic work into the lives of those that are lonely. They both had a lot to say on the matter and they gave very insightful information into the causes of loneliness. They both focused on the lack of real emotional connection as being a root cause of loneliness and we can use this to establish if loneliness is a cause of technology use or vice versa. Loneliness can start gradually. Sometimes people look back on their life and realise they've had this feeling of loneliness for a long time. Loneliness can begin when we stop speaking our truth. We can distort ourselves to please others or to try and fit in. After a while, we've abandoned who we truly are, our authentic self. This can create a feeling of loneliness within us, loneliness of the self. After learning what caused loneliness, I went to speak with a student called Max. Max is a little bit sceptical of technology and worries about the negative implications of it, especially on a younger audience. Therefore, it was imperative to speak with him to understand where these fears come from and if they relate to the wider issue of loneliness. Hi, I'm Max. I'm a uh, philosophy student at University of Brighton. And I think I'm doing this interview because I'm sceptical of technology. I think we should be more concerned about the long-term effects of being so sort of caught up in this tech, all in all these technologies. So I don't know, I feel like there could be negative consequences down the road if we don't sort of realize the potential for all this sort of insistence on technology in all circumstances to, to go a bit wrong. The, the sort of stuff that I'm alluding to more is social media. I don't think social media is particularly useful. You know, like lots of people, uh, this, everyone knows that the fact that you, you don't put your real life on social media, you sort of try to give a, uh, a rose-tinted version of your life that makes you look, seem a bit more successful, a bit more popular, like you're having more fun than you actually are. And then obviously people compare themselves to the ideal rather than the reality. And we, there's lots of research based on that and its connection to mental health issues. And obviously we have like a mental health crisis at the moment. And I think that's got strong links to social media. The way that we go about our daily, like, like just normal things that you sort of take for granted, you don't realise are actually influenced by an algorithm that exists because the owner of Facebook or the owner of Google has placed it there. So like an example I think of is the fact that nobody, like I don't know many people that go up and talk to, like if they were trying to get a date, people are more likely to sort of try get in the person's eye line or like make the person notice them and then wait till they get home so that they can try find them on Instagram or Facebook or see that they find somebody on Tinder and stuff and then they message them. What it just means is that we're worse at communicating with each other, a lot less open as well. Like we, we feel like we're connecting with lots of different people but we're not connecting in a meaningful way. I think technology plays a part in the lack of meaningful interactions but it's not, it's not necessarily just like, oh, because you're doing it through a screen, you, um, you can't get the same meaning behind it. I think the, the real problem is it, it encourages you to uh, aim for a sort of interaction with someone that is meaningless. Because it's all based on algorithms, all your connections with these people on social media are based around you getting a dopamine rush. So instead of trying to connect with these people in a meaningful way, you're encouraged to connect with them in a way that will give you the dopamine rush. A large part about the mental health issue and social media is social media encourages you to be a narcissist. It encourages you to assume that everybody is talking and thinking about you and it gives you an actual gauge on how much people are talking and thinking about you in terms of like how many likes you're getting or how many times someone retweets you or something. This is something that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago, the fact that 
all like the fact that all boys have a, a boys group chat, the girls have a girls group chat. It's just, it's strange that it impacts your lives in ways that you don't even realise. Because we have so much opportunity to meet people, and because we're always, we always think, oh, I could just talk to somebody where I don't have to show my face, I don't have to risk embarrassment, face-to-face -face contact. It means that we'll often go for the non-face-to-face -face option over the face-to-face -face option just because it's less embarrassing or it's, you're, you're less likely to feel awkward. All of the um, new opportunities to new, meet new people through social media actually causes a bigger problem of nobody wanting to actually talk to somebody in person because why would you? As Max made very clear, technology does rule young people's lives nowadays, rather than what it was like 15 or 20 years ago. But have young people learned to deal with this as they grew up, rather than let it control everything about them? With everything in life, it's about the balance. Technology can have both positive and negative impacts on those that are lonely. Kyleen writes about loneliness, stating that sometimes the cause can also be the consequence. It is impossible to say whether loneliness causes various conditions or vice versa. To finally get a clear picture of the whole situation, I spoke with Becky, a research fellow and co-leader of the Digital and Technology Cluster. So therefore, she is the perfect candidate to give a final input into the debate and give some more insight. Hi, I'm Dr Becky Faith and I lead the Digital and Technology Research Group at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. But my particular area of expertise is on um, overall in the use of technology in developing countries and particularly mobile phones, which has been an area of expertise of mine for, I'd say, about 15 years now. So in the UK, I think uh, we have quite a kind of codependent relationship on our uh, mobile phones. And this is something that I looked at in my PhD. Uh, and that's even more so now, but I think it's probably a kind of healthier codependent relationship. Um, so there's a sense in which we rely on our mobile phones for everything, for staying connected to uh, our employers, our friends, our families, to get uh, information, to um, maintain our health, to shop. So we're really dependent on them and that's become really, really obvious now. But I also think um, there's real cause for concern in the ways that uh, digital platforms use, uh, engineer their platforms to be very addictive. Uh, they engineer them so for clicks, basically. So you want to keep on clicking and swiping. And I think that's actually not terribly healthy. So I think we do have this very, very addictive, a lot of us do, and we have this very addictive relationship. And if they were all taken away, well, I think it's not a, an exaggeration to say that civilization would crumble um, in the sense that um, our, the communications infrastructure is has become as important to us as other forms of infrastructure. So lighting and uh, electricity and water and so on and so forth to the extent that uh, some people, some bodies say, well, access to the internet or access to telecommunications networks is a human right. It's something that's so essential to kind of human thriving and uh, human life that it should be, what well, could be free, as, the, as the, we have the idea in the, the Labour Party suggested that broadband should be free. And I think we're heading towards that now in the, in the pandemic as we see mobile companies lifting their data caps. So I think all of those things, that reflection of how important uh, mobiles are in society, says that if that was taken away, if that infrastructure was taken away, things would really collapse. I think things could look pretty even more scary than they do at the moment without mobile phones. But again, it's a really interesting time to be asking those questions about whether mobile phones are doing a, a good thing or a bad thing in people's lives. And I think at the moment, the kind of just the connections that they're bringing and the connections to services and information, I think they're actually uh, a net positive, really. So do I think loneliness uh, is increased by technology use? So there's a theorist called Sherry Turkle, and she had this big theory that, that technology is making, making us lose those social connections um, and increasing loneliness because we're just interacting virtually. 
but again that's everything's been shaken up by the coronavirus pandemic because i think we're seeing how people those virtual connections those only virtual connections are, are very real connections and they're helping to ease loneliness so while the kind of stereotype and there's been a kind of dominate a thing in the kind of communication studies literature about it, that Sherry Turkle thing of oh it's making people lonelier and the idea that you have the kind of stereotype of a group of people sat around a table in a pub and they're all on their phones or whatever but actually we've seen in the past few weeks just how important um, mobile phones are um, for, for overcoming loneliness and for finding connection what will what that will look like afterwards in terms of uh, maintaining kind of building that's what all that social capital look like when this is all over I don't know that's a, another really interesting question one of the challenges I face as a researcher in digital technologies is to to make visible digital in our lives because I think we take it in our in this country with the levels of connectivity and the access to um, digital tools that we have they're so ubiquitous as to be invisible and sometimes it's a challenge to say actually look at all these tools that are mediating our every um, our every engagement when you go out for dinner you'll be looking for the reviews on TripAdvisor of the restaurant you're going to you'll be communicating with your friends how late you're going to be on WhatsApp um, but I think one of the issues is to to visibilise that and to, to make sure that people can see it and see how all those tools and technologies are mediating our every relationship. And the same goes for everything from shopping to political activism. I think it's actually an easier question to say, well, what's it, what's it not <laughs> impacting on? What area of our daily lives isn't it impacting on? Just to, to re-emphasise that point about making not just the technologies visible, but also making the power relationships which exist in those technologies visible. So uh, who owns the platforms, who's online, who's offline, what power does that give them, who has the power to, to uh, say what, where. So asking those questions about who has the power to decide what happens with technology I think is really really important um, and I and I love to see people asking those questions not just in academic circles but more broadly. As these technologies are relatively new there cannot be a fully true answer to the issue instead there needs to overall be more research into the relationship between the two to see if one causes the other, or instead if we are just creatures of habit. Loneliness is something that is very tricky and can frankly be hard to understand if we do not start investing into proper facilities to help those that are feeling lonely. As for loneliness with technology, anything that is being used to distract us from our feelings, usually uncomfortable feelings, such as boredom, sadness, stuckness, etc., is in my opinion going to have a negative impact on our well-being. The antithesis of this is understanding ourselves and balancing our technology time with meeting people and interacting with others. Griffin mentioned that cognitive function improves if a relationship is physical as well as intellectual, mainly because of the chemical process taking place during face-to-face -face encounters with others. On the other hand, while not face-to-face -face contact, it is likely to be better than no contact at all, especially for those living far away from friends and loved ones, so mobile phones can provide to be a real helper in that sense.